something in the air. Maybe it's in the stars, maybe it's in the water, maybe it's just floating around, just out of reach behind some unseen curtain. I don't know what it is. My astrologically flaky side says it's the end of Mercury retrograde, the stars going direct and saying, hey, it's time for all of you to fight. And I say that because almost everybody I know right now is in some form of conflict of relationship. Mostly heterosexual, that's all I'm kind of qualified to speak on, but I'm seeing all these couples, all these men and women scrapping, like really blatantly going at each other in public, yelling and swearing and tears and outright aggressiveness and painful passive aggressiveness. I'm experiencing it too. And something that was in common, a thread in all of these fights that I witnessed when I spoke to people afterwards, because people for some strange reason, even though I'm a complete relationship failure, seem to want to confide in me what they're going through and ask me for advice. I'm like, oh, geez. You know, I guess in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, right? Maybe, they say, so they say. And the one thing I keep hearing again and again, especially from my female friends, and hey folks, that's just the way I roll. Most of my friends have always been and seem to always be and maybe shall always be girls. They all come up with the same question. Where have the real men gone? And that always rubs me a little wrong because what does that mean, real man? What does man even mean anymore in these days of gender identity and fluidity and all these things? When there are no examples out in the real world of what a good man is, because all we're hearing about is toxic masculinity and how guys are screwing things up. They've destroyed the planet. They just want war. They're sexually aggressive or in advertising, we mock them for being ineffective, incapable, impotent, all these things. If you've seen the cover of the video version of this podcast, you'll see the infamous face of Ric Flair, woo, himself, who I think popularly coined the phrase, to be the man, woo, you gotta beat the man. And yet it doesn't mean the, the person with uh, uh, the correct genital structure doesn't mean that. In fact, if we use another parallel in pro wrestling, right now one of the most popular wrestlers in the world, Becky Lynch, calls herself the man. And she, trust me, at least from the pictorials I've seen, is all woman. No, the man means something else. It means to have power, to have control, to have the situation on lock. And yeah, maybe I'm not that guy, never have been. Maybe my friends, significant others, don't seem to have their emotions or their personal situations, their finances, their sexuality, their whatever it may be. Maybe they don't know what they are yet. Maybe because we don't have examples on how to be it. Maybe we're unsure. We're in this nebulous state of the world where all the messaging is saying to women, you can be whatever you want. But man, eh, everything you've done is wrong so far. So wait, go on pause, listen for now. And that makes sense. But I can't help but flash back to my own youth, to living in rural Nova Scotia and having no desire whatsoever, for whatever reason, to go out and work with my dad in the field to, you know, till the soil, to do the gardening, to, you know, make a hole and put a post in it to cut stuff in the garage on the bandsaw, I just, that just wasn't me. I preferred to stay in and do the vacuuming and help with the dishes. And I thought that was cool, at least I'm helping, but more often than not, the comment that followed was, oh my little daughter, Brooke. And that stuff gets into a kid's psyche in his formative years. That stuff makes you start thinking, I guess there could be something wrong with me? Maybe something's missing? I guess I'm not manly enough? No, I'm, I'm imagining. And then we moved to Sutton, Ontario, and if you remember that first episode of Buddha and the Slut, Peaks and Geeks, I talked about being the one sensitive kid in a goddamn hockey town. 
So when I expressed my feelings or when I sang a ditty or when I crossed my legs incorrectly too tightly as I'm just known to do, invariably the response would be, Fuck! And a beating would surely follow. And I, you know, I don't mean beating as in senseless and, you know, hospitalization, but I do mean being pinned down and spat in the face. I do mean a couple of slaps here and there, or at least let's hit him till he cries. It was enough. It was enough to show me. As the girls laughed when the boys did this to me, it was enough to show me that I must be missing something. And to be over here in Southeast Asia of the last seven years, and to see so many amazing and strong and brave women traveling alone, which maybe 20 years ago they wouldn't have done, but they're here now and they're experiencing life and they're digging into the experience of it all, of being free, of figuring out who they are and what they want and what they like, invariably they keep coming to me and saying, I miss real men. At home, men are all too nice and soft and wait for me to make decisions. I miss that directness, that hardness, that no bullshit. I don't want to hear your feelings. Just, you know, shut up and lift stuff and pound me a good one. And you're thinking, oh, Brooke, that's just not happening. Yeah, it is. It is across the board, especially from Western Europeans, especially from my Scandinavian friends or my Russian friends or my stronger British female friends. They come over and they look for the other adventurous guy. They look for the muscle Muay Thai fighter. They look for the dude who's just, you know, cast his fortune into the river and uh, plays it by ear each day and is a lovable, roguish chap. Yeah, I've played that role more than once. It's effective. The weird thing is, though, the really weird thing is we can ascribe this to cultural conditioning or we can look at it as a case of, you know, biological preference. I think I've spoken about this on the podcast before where, hey, if you look at the hormonal flow or the, the flux in the, again, the heterosexual female form, you realize that studies have shown, post-Kinsey, studies have shown that three weeks of the month, a woman tends to look for someone with softer, rounder features, someone who's gentler, soft-spoken, kind, would be a good nurturer, good with children, a good provider, agreeable, amenable, all these things. But then one week a month during ovulation at peak fertility, what a woman has shown to desire is a broader jaw, a stronger brow, deeper set eyes, a V-shaped body, pretty much your archetypal Superman who will get that seed in there and get the job done. But the problem is, thanks to God's infuriating design, it would seem, that never the twain shall meet. It is so fucking rare that one man could embody both of those sides at just the time his woman would need them or want them or request them or crave them. And it makes it all seem like an absurd joke and it's the root of all of this conflict of us not giving each other what we want and need when we want it and need it. And this takes me back to a story, a personal one, of course, that's what this podcast is about. And maybe I touched upon it before. Maybe my doddering old man brain is completely forgetting that I shared this with you earlier, but I'm going to record it anyway, and I'll hear about it in the comments. Because I don't have time to go through 30 podcasts and check to see if I gave the abbreviated version already. But from about 26 to 33 years old, I had the longest relationship, romantic relationship of my life. Now, there's a Seinfeld joke in there somewhere about, you know, a relationship can be done, but it's never actually done because trying to end one that's not working is like trying to topple a Coca-Cola machine. If you're trying to rock one of those big Coke machines, you gotta rock it forwards and then backwards or side to side and you go one way and it almost tips and then its weight brings it back to the other and you keep doing it and doing it and, uh, and finally it topples over and usually ends up crushing someone. So that's a, an apt metaphor for relationship ending. Now, in my seven year one with the fair young lass, who was 20 when I was 26 and we started dating, 
I think we kind of knew deep down in our bones that it was done after three years. But we both stayed in it. We had our individual reasons for staying. You know, it's the devil you know, it's familiarity, it's comfort, it's in some cases it's addiction, at least on my end it was for sure. And you look at that and you go like, what works and what doesn't in these long relationships or in the ones that are like fraught with conflict? When are you getting along and when are you not? And for me, it seemed more often than not, it worked when some aspect of my personality was giving her what she needed in that moment. But when the other side of myself, the feminine, the soft, or when the aggressive, the intense, came out at a time that was not working for her, it was the root or the seed or the epicenter of the conflict in the relationship. Now, seven years comes around and it was unspoken, but finally clearly understood that this was done. And as we were kind of, you know, breaking contact and tidying up loose ends and separating stuff and all the things that happened at the trash fire that is breaking up, her mom got in touch with me. Now, you know, I'd had a couple of talks with her mom, a pretty cool cat, I must say. And, you know, it maybe happened once a year, twice a year, even though she lived close by, we'd have these really in-depth conversations. It would go from just surface chat about life and drinking and smoking weed and cats and what was happening on the news. And, hey, we watched Survivor together, so that was something, right? But I knew in the call that she gave me, I could tell in the tone of her voice that she was ready to drop some knowledge on me. And she's like, Brooke, I want you to come over. I need to speak with you. I knew she wasn't angry, but she had something important to say. So it was in the morning. I grabbed a coffee, a little bit of breakfast, and then I walked over to her apartment about five blocks away. Now she opened the door, greeted me there. Brooke, come on in. Now her thick curly locks cascading over her shoulders. Uh, Quite a handsome woman, as they say, for someone middle-aged. You know, she gained a bit of weight and, you know, had the world weariness in her eyes. But there was still the spark of that beautiful, breathtaking, hippie, hippie lady who strutted down Granville in Vancouver and turned all the men's heads in the 60s. You know, she was an admitted kind of groupie back in the day and, uh, you know, had a few rock star dalliances and important people in town. And it's understandable why when you see the photos of her <laughs> and the apple definitely did not fall far from the tree. Now, her mom sits me down. I'll just say mom from now on. Mom sits me down and puts a very strong Caesar in my hand. For those of you who aren't Canadian, essentially it's a Bloody Mary, but with clam juice, okay? So she puts a Caesar in my hand. It's 10.30 in the morning. I'm like, hey, mom, it's a little bit early. She's like, shut up, drink it. I'm like, okay. And I lit a cigarette, because she had already lit a cigarette, so it was a safe space to do so, and I knew that a little bit of stress might be coming. And she sits down across from me on the couch. I'm on a little ottoman, kind of squatting there, ready for the grilling that's to come, I thought. And then she packs her pipe, full of the green stuff. Hey, it's Vancouver, right? And lights it, takes a deep, deep drag assumes the Buddha pose on the couch, folds up her feet, then hands me the pipe, and she's like, here. I'm like, Mom, no, it's it's early, and I want to have a clear at Jade Brook. Smoke it. So I did, as I was asked, because it's the end of the relationship, and I didn't know whether I'd see this woman again, and I kind of gleaned that this was a moment where respect was to be offered through these actions. It was her home, her arena, and her daughter. So, okay. Now, Brooke, I just want you to listen, she said, as she exhaled again a big plume of smoke. I have known a lot of men in my time. And I nodded and smiled, and again that phrase echoed in my head, "Uh uh-huh, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. That was one of the bones of contention in the relationship, my immature self not being able to handle the romantic history of my partner. 
And again, mom says, now I might have known a lot of men more than most women could ever know or imagine being connected to in a romantic or friendship way. And let me tell you, out of all the men, the hundreds, if not thousands of men that I have had the pleasure of crossing my path in my lifetime, of all of them, I have never met a man as equally balanced in his masculine and his feminine sides as you. And I perked up a little, and for a second, I was wondering, is, is this a compliment? Is this a good thing? Am I, am I about to learn something about myself that will propel me forward into this next phase with positive energy and confidence that I've been craving for so long? But no, she shook her head, narrowed her gaze, pinned me down with it, and said, I feel sorry for you. I sat in silence, I think. I think I shook my head and rolled my eyes and got a little bit tense and kind of just whispered, why? And she said, because. The world still doesn't know what it wants men to be. And it has a very specific idea of what those roles are. You're one or the other. You're either going to be the soft, caring, loving, emotional, gentle man who people will be drawn to because they feel safe and they want to be understood and heard. But then there's the other side of you, Brooke. That fire, that intensity, that sharpness like a sword that's been hammered and heated all oh, right to the edge. It is so much. You fill a room. You make women gasp when you're rolling in your zone. And the thing is, that's incredibly attractive and incredibly desirable, but if someone is craving that gentleness and that softness at the time, and you're seeing this side of you, it's too much. It's too intense. It's scary. It's frightening. So because you can express both so clearly, people are, or at least a romantic partner is going to have moments where they're either frightened of you or repulsed by you. I'm sorry. And that's going to be a cross you're probably going to have to bear for the rest of your life. I nodded, even though I didn't want to. I finished my drink and smoked the bowl and played with her cats and listened to a few more stories. I gave her a sincere hug and then I left. I walked home those five blocks and I sat in front of the TV and I think I binged Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That's saying something in and of itself. And so that brings us to today now this moment these few days this astrological charting of discomfort and conflict that people seem to be experiencing in their relationships where my female compatriots are saying where have all the real men gone well i'm here to tell you we don't know how to be real men because what is a real man really I've been asking that question for 48 and a half years. And my biggest worry is I'm going to be asking it for 48 and a half more. Because some days I'm going to come blazing out of the gate. I'm going to have fire in my eyes and I'm going to have curse words on my lips. And I'm going to pin you down. I'm going to stare you into oblivion and you're going to ache for the power that I possess. And then the next day, I'm going to be curled up at the foot of the bed or huddled in the shower and racked with sobs because I'm feeling being alive so intensely and all I want is to be held. I make the jokes about being a lesbian in a man's body, but half the time, yes, I just want to curl up in a bath with some red wine and listening to beautiful music and thinking about the romantic inclinations I had throughout my youth of living somewhere in the Mediterranean and... My true love's on the balcony and she's painting a sunset and I'm inside cooking dinner in an apron and nothing else. And yes, that sounds cheesy, but that's part of who I am and there's nothing wrong with it. Except in this world of conflict. In this world where tribal lines continue to be drawn and redrawn again and again and again. 
We're in the state of hyper-tribalism where man is this and woman is that and straight is this and gay is that and all these different genders and all these different belief systems and political alignments and religious expression and we've lost who we are. And we've lost the feeling that we're allowed to be all of who we are, which is so incredibly crippling. I've said it before, and I'll say it once again. There is no worse feeling, at least in my life, than knowing you've got the potential to be a Ferrari racing on the Autobahn, but the world won't let you get out of second gear. That you're an Arabian stallion, bred to race and win in the Preakness, to run like the wind, and yet you've been bought by a farmer, yoked up, and told you can only plow a field. I want to know who I am. I want to be all that I am. And there is nothing more satisfying than the thought of doing that in the sacred crucible of relationship, of connection, capital C. But how can I do that? If half the time, what I am is wrong or doesn't work or causes pain and duress and discomfort. I just want to make those I love happy, but I am no longer willing to do it at the cost of myself. And maybe that's what I really needed to learn. Maybe that's all I needed to know. That's the secret. Maybe that's what it means to be the man.